Hi, I'm Darlene Carmen. And I'm Doug Carmen. Welcome to the show. Our guest gave up her career as a lawyer to study yoga. She's now a dedicated yoga teacher. She writes about her experience of uh, never feeling full or satisfied in her Silver Nautilus award-winning memoir, Full, How I Learned to Satisfy My Insatiable Hunger and Feed My Soul. Kimber Simpkins is here to tell and show us how she learned to quiet hunger by nourishing her mind and body. So glad you could be here. Oh, thanks so much for inviting me. It's my honor. Congratulations on your <laughs> Silver Nautilus Award. Thank you That's so fantastic. much. Fantastic. You must come from a long line of uh, a talented authors, I would assume. Actually, my whole family is made up of doctors and nurses and healers and a lot of teachers. So having a writer in the family is a little bit of a new thing. Wow. But oh, wow. I've loved to write since I was a child. And my fifth grade teacher, in fact, told me once that he really wanted to read my first book. And so I dedicated my first book to him. Oh, so now you're going to yeah. probably start another long line somewhere. It'll continue starting out with you. That's great. That'd be great. So full is uh, an account of your experience w dealing with anorexia nervosa. So if you could kind of explain this deadly illness and how it takes hold of people and maybe some of the symptoms that people should watch out for. It's yeah, in my case, what kind of brought it on for me was both um, a lot of media images um, from magazines of this perception of like what um, women should look like. Yeah. And I really, those, those visuals were very compelling for me and I felt a lot of pressure from them. I felt a lot of peer pressure, but also in addition to that, um, I started dieting. And it was at a time when my mother started dieting and my sister and I kind of started dieting with her and we went to the diet center and we got weighed and we brought home the weird meals and I wasn't very good at dieting. <laughs> I didn't like the food and I didn't like being able to, not being able to eat and I didn't, wasn't very effective at losing weight and, and keeping it off. And eventually what I figured out for myself was the only way to lose the weight that I wanted to lose was to not eat at all, oh. which was a terrible oh. thing to do to myself. It was a terrible thing to do to my body. It was really messed with my mind and, and was, became this very difficult problem then that I had to deal with for decades afterwards. Wow. So how can people recognize the signs if they have, maybe they suspect somebody in their family has it? And this is a lot of times women, uh, teenagers, that have it? Yeah, I want to just acknowledge that it's really hard to know the signs. That oh. part of, certainly for me, for my eating disorder was I was intentionally hiding it from my parents. It, it would have been really difficult for them to have noticed what was going on. And that's true of many eating disorders. And sometimes what can just be someone going through a really difficult experience can look like an eating disorder on the outside. And another time someone who looks totally fine on the outside can really be suffering with an eating disorder within. And so it is good to notice certain things like is somebody hiding food? Is somebody having um, difficulty? eating, is someone going to the bathroom right after they've eaten, Ooh. right? You can notice those type of things. Um, and it's really good to, to observe them and to be really compassionate in approaching someone about it, compassionate and non-judgmental. But one of the most important things I would say is that when you um, are told by someone, I think I'm having trouble with my eating, or I think I'm having trouble with my body image, to really listen to that, to really hear that, to not just dismiss it as something um, that you know they're imagining. No, to take that kind of thing seriously. It, well, in your case, you didn't really talk about it that much. You just uh, you wore baggy clothes and played with the food, you know, kind of make little piles of peas or whatever. <laughs> but uh, you, you really did do a good job of hiding it. And, but you weren't really, I don't think, that open to talking about it. And I think a lot of young people at that age uh, really don't like to talk about themselves. And so, you know, would you suggest that they would go to a doctor or a therapist or something like that? Or? I would say that if you are someone who's like watching this program and know that your issues with food and with your body are, are really not serving you, not supporting you in your life, that you, you sense they're, that they're really not aligned with, with who you are in some way or what you want, um, or you just sense that there's, there's something really wrong, to go to 
um, a teacher, to go to a counselor, um, to tell your parents, to ask for help, and mm. to keep asking for help until you get the help you need. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think I'll, and I've heard this said before, a lot of people say that uh, an eating disorder, usually in a young girl, uh, they kind of grow out of it. And is that a myth or is there something to that? Do they finally... You know, that's that? such a good question because we do have this stereotype in our culture that it's mostly young white women, especially teenagers, who get um, eating disorders. Yeah. And the truth is, is that eating disorders affect everyone wow. of every age, of every it's race. Come on, any time. Oh, men yeah. and women. And actually, there's, there's really interesting studies out now that show that um, people, older people are especially susceptible to um, the onset of an eating disorder, even if they've never had any other issue with it before, when there's some major life crisis, like oh. a divorce or the loss of a spouse or the loss of a job or the loss of a home, that that can actually tr sometimes trigger an eating disorder in certain people. Wow, so I didn't know that. Any time, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, and, and it is deadly. It can be. In fact, anorexia itself is one of the... Um, mental illnesses with the highest um, fatality rate. Mm. So getting help around eating disorders is really important. Mm. Um, you mentioned going to the, bath uh, to the bathroom a lot and that would be considered like bulimia where you have to throw up after yeah. you eat all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but one really interesting thing to know about bulimia is that there's more than one kind of bulimia. Oh, one really? kind of bulimia we don't often think about is exercise bulimia, is people who um, eat and then they feel like they have to purge by exercising a lot. Oh. And oh. that can be, that also causes so exercising own also is another it's form. It's another form they, of bulimia sometimes. You know, yeah. they, they, they take in a big meal, but then they got to run and exercise all day because they feel like they got to get rid of that. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's where it's really good to notice what your relationship is to food and guilt. Mm. <laughs> that to me, if I'm eating something and what I'm, and I'm feeling guilty about it, I'm eating the guilt with that food. <laughs> and you know what? I'm on a guilt-free diet. <laughs> I don't eat guilt. If I'm gonna eat something, I'm gonna eat it and enjoy, and enjoy it. it. And there's no punishment afterwards. There's no, oh no, I shouldn't have done that. It's like, if my body wanted it and it feels good in my body, that's great. If for some reason I ate more of something than feels good in my body, that's a information for myself to just know, hey, Maybe like tune in a little next time and notice when you're full and, and not eat as much. But it's not, there's no punishment about it. I do it because I care for myself, because I want to feel good, not because I'm trying to make up for something I did wrong. Ugh. Now, in your battle with endless hunger, you describe like nine different types of hunger. So can you give us some of the basics of those? I can't yeah. even think of nine different types. Right. <laughs> so I found it really helpful because I was asking myself this question of, why am I hungry all the time? And so it was really helpful for me to sort of dissect, like, what do I mean when I say I'm hungry? Because there's some hunger that's really physical. Like, I have one type of hunger that I call blood sugar crash hunger, and that's where, like, I just haven't eaten enough lately, and my blood sugar crashes, and then after that I get panic hunger, which is like a shaky feeling mm. that I have to eat right away. And those are, those are more physical types of hunger, but then there are more mental and emotional oh. types of hunger. You can mean you can actually have a psychological hunger that, exactly. that drives you. That feel, that, uh, does it actually make you feel like you're hungry in the psychological one, or does it, is it I, just that you just have to eat? Yeah, I, I sort of interpreted it as hunger, uh, and that was like anxiety, like when I was yeah. feeling anxious about money or about work, <laughs> this sense of, of like, <laughs> Sounds mm, like what I have. Something sounds good to eat, yeah. <laughs> There's also um, what I call nostalgic hunger, which is when you're reading a menu and you see like apple pie and you have to think like, is it as good as grandma's? <laughs> and then like, I wasn't hungry for it before, but seeing the words and feeling the nostalgia for it, like gotta suddenly, have it. Have it. Right. Gotta that have it. <laughs> that memory like prods me to be hungry, <laughs> even, if I'm, even if I'm not really hungry for it. I can relate to that. So the, the growling of the stomach, that would be a physical one. Right. Um, I've noticed with a lot of people, it, I, I, you, they even say something about it, but like a reward. 
Yes. You know, they did something good, so, well, I deserve, I can't think of what they say, but something like, I deserve, or I'm going to treat myself. Yes. And isn't that like a reward hunger? Definitely. If I had a name for it, that's what I would call it. Yes, there's definitely that type of hunger of like, I yeah. did really good yeah. today. It's yeah, like giving yourself a, the uh, gold star yeah, something chocolate good bar. happens, I, I want to celebrate by having bowl of ice cream or something Why like that. not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do, I do that all the time. Right. There's oh. also, for me, like I got to reward myself another way. Though. Right. That's what I got to do. It's good to take food out of the category of reward and punishment, for sure. Oh, my mm. But I really found um, this place of addressing my spiritual hunger as well. And that was something I wasn't really aware of, that I had this hunger for something that was more like connection that was more like a sense of fulfillment and purpose and and just fundamental well-being in my life and i was trying to fill that need with food mm. <laughs> and it turns out like that need actually needs to be filled with soul food like food for your soul and i had to learn how to feed that part of myself not with food not with anything that could show up on a plate but with things that were really meaningful for me and well, that, gave me a sense of connection. Well, that, doesn't that feel more satisfying, I would think? Absolutely. Because, you know, in, in your book, you talk about just never feeling satisfied. And even you would just finish eating and like maybe 10, 20 minutes later, you want to eat some more. And for you, it seemed to be the enjoyment Am I wrong? The enjoyment of just the motion of eating, wasn't it? Yeah. Not so much about, fe well, feeling full is one thing, but it was, you liked it enjoy the mouth sensation. I don't know how to say that. Absolutely. <laughs> Although part of it, it starts out with enjoying the mouth sensation, but I know for many of us who have the experience of binging, that what happens ultimately is that we're not even feeling the mouth sure. sensations. Mm. We're sort of using the food to numb ourselves oh. and to not feel, in fact, and to sort of mm. check out. And well, that's something to be really aware of. Well, you mean you talked about some, you know, people ex over exercising. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it? Um, and you know that exercise helps you to lose weight. But uh, what is it about yoga that uh, surpasses uh, normal exercise that you do? What yeah. is, is there something special about yoga that's different than going out Regular and doing exercise. some calisthenics or something? Yeah, yeah but, there's some. Um, so. The really important thing is to find movement that your body loves and that you love to do. You so it's love a different doing thing. it. You're not you're not doing movements that you're you're you're, you're straining your body or, or causing physical pain. You know you know what are they saying? Uh, no pain, no gain. Yeah. So you're doing things with your body I that are making idea. you feel good. Let's just see some of this. Could we oh, see yeah. some of this I'd yoga? Love to see what you're doing. I'd love to share it with you. I found yoga to be especially healing around my eating disorder and body image issues. And partly because what it gives me is a better sense of my proprioception. That's where my body is in space. And yoga especially helps us to really map our body onto our brains. And that helps our brains respond to our body as, our, as something whole, as something complete, as something that belongs to it. And that's really important. So what I'd like to share with you <laughs> is about five yoga exercises okay. that people can do at home without a mat, just on your own um, carpet. carpet at home. Yeah. And you can do them just one at a time. You could do them all separately, or you could do them as one sort of 10 minute long sequence. Okay. So I want to start out with yogic self-massage. Mm, and the great thing, it. so many of us, we love massage. <laughs> massage is, is a wonderful way to take care of ourselves. We don't know that we can do it for ourselves. Okay. And one of the wonderful things about massage is that it helps increase that proprioception, our ability to map our body in space, that we recognize our body as our own. But it also has a special effect of releasing oxytocin. Oh, mm. yes, I got the good, good hormone. Stuff, the right? good hormone. <laughs> the yeah. oxytocin is the hormone. cuddle hormone. And so it <laughs> actually helps you to feel more of a sense of affection for your own body. Oh, so first, oh. will you do this with me? So bit. first, we rub our hands <laughs> oh, together. <laughs> you rub your hands together, and you feel a sense, getting a sense of like warmth um, into your hands, and maybe even a sense of affection <laughs> towards yourself. I like to think of it as um, what our friends think about us, the ways in which our friends love us. That you're you're warming that between your hands, mm -hmm. and now 
go ahead and bring it to your head and rub it into your head. <laughs> you can rub it. If you don't want to mess up your hat, you can rub it into the sides of your head. <laughs> what hair? No. <laughs> you can rub it into your temples. And it might seem a little goofy at first to do this to yourself, but it can be so healing. Yeah. Rub it into the back of the ears and the back of the neck and the back of the head. And if you find a spot where you really need a little extra bit of massage, go ahead and get in there with your fingers. And then you can massage the sides, right between the shoulders and the neck is a really good place to get into where a lot of us get tight from working on the computer and from driving. And then cross your arms and massage all the way down your arms, all the way down to the forearms. Cross the hands and move all the way back up again. And then go ahead and bring your hands to your belly and your back and give yourself a little bit of massage up and down. And then you can bring one hand over your heart and one hand over your belly and just close your eyes and feel that for a moment and see how that feels to connect to your body this way. And I do this practice every day. And I find for myself that it really helps me feel the sense of connection to my body um, that I really enjoy and that I really value. And the touch can be really light, can be very light, very affectionate. Um, you can do it as, as much as feels comfortable to you. And to notice if there are parts of your body that are hard to touch is a really good thing to, to observe as well. Mm. So this next exercise is one that, um, that you can also do every day. And it's a variation on the sun salutation. And so from here, we stand straight and tall with the arms at the sides. And then inhale and sweep the arms up alongside the ears. At the top, the hands touch. And then bring the hands down to the crown of the head, along the outside of the head, the sides of the throat, the sides of the waist, all the way down the outside of the legs, across the tops of the feet, up the insides of the legs, and then hands to the, all the way up the arms, to the shoulders, and then back down again to the belly and massage the belly and back. And you can see there's parts of this that are similar to what we did with the self-massage. And so it's a sort of standing self-massage. And then bringing the hands over the belly and pausing. And I like to do it three times. And the second time, I like to, as I inhale my arms up and bring the hands over the crown of the head to think about pushing away any negative energy, maybe something that someone said about my body during the day, maybe something that I thought myself about my body during the day, and just releasing and letting go of any negative energy towards my body, around my body. And then again, massaging the belly and the back and the hips. You can do three times each direction. Then, last time, inhale up. This time, inviting in positive energy for your body, positive energy for yourself, all the way down, across the tops of the feet, up the insides of the legs, hands all the way up to the shoulders, and then back down to the belly, to the belly and the hips and the back. And then again, let yourself just see how that feels. And I notice for myself that often my body feels a little warmer then, a little more connected. Then for the next exercise, you're going to stand with your feet a little wider apart. You're going to bring your hands up here by your shoulders. Inhale here. And on your exhale, turn the hands down and bend the knees as if you're pushing the air out. So you inhale up and exhale down. And what this does is helps to really create the sense of the body and the breath moving together. And it can feel so good to feel the breath moving into the lungs, feel the body and the breath moving all as one. So you might do that 10 times. Really feel that sense of connection inside. Such simple movements, but can be so profound. Then for this next one, you'll come all the way to hands and knees on the floor. And for this one, this one's called cat cow. <laughs> 
And so you start out, hands and knees, any place that's comfortable for you. You can even bring a blanket or a pillow underneath your knees. Then inhale your head and your chest forward. And exhale, release your head between your arms. Sweep your back up towards the ceiling. You inhale your head and chest forward. And exhale, release back over. And continue doing that anywhere from five to 10 times. You can feel really good on the spine. Again, moving with the breath. Then to finish up, it's nice to do a child's pose. In child's pose, we bring the toes together and the knees wide apart and slowly sit back towards the heels and bring the forehead to the floor. And child's pose is a really nice place to rest and breathe and especially connect to the breath in the back body. Wow. Yeah. Very nice. Well, you know, I wasn't doing the exercise, as you may have noticed, but I felt relaxed just watching you. Oh, great. <laughs> I, I'm so glad. Yeah, very, very relaxing. So do you want to ask a question? Well, yeah, I did have a question. It isn't just uh, uh, women who have a uh, problem, let's say, with their body image. Uh, how many men do you have in your class? Yeah, my yoga classes generally have anywhere from 10 to 20 percent men in them. And it's true that men nowadays are under a lot of pressure um, around their bodies. One thing I noticed, I took my partner's G.I. Joe doll um, from childhood and put it next to my son's G.I. Joe doll <laughs> from his childhood. And the, the older G.I. Joe doll was, didn't have any particular like shapely physique. Just looked like a very, very average man. And the new one had, was ripped, really had like bugged. giant muscles, <laughs> like you muscles. Know, six pack abs, and like it was just amazing. And it really made me realize that um, boys and men now are under more uh, pressure more. From, from the media and from outside um, oh, than, than, they, than they have been in the past, perhaps. Oh, this changing world we, we are living in. <laughs> well, let's see, your next book is coming out in January. 52 Ways to Love Your Body. So can you tell us what it'll be covering? Oh, I'm really excited about this book. So it's actually the how-to version of my book, Full. Mm -hmm. And it has all kinds of wonderful practices in it that are really spiritually based for learning to love your body, for coming to peace with food, to creating a relationship with your body and yourself that's more friendly. And it gives you a lot more time then to not be so caught up in negativity around your body and how you're eating during the day. It's, um, it can be really heart opening. Yeah. You gotta watch your uh, connections to you. The, the people that are around you and the negativity and all that, I'm sure you cover that. I know you covered it in this first book too, but that, that's really something. Tell us about your new online class starting in November. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thanks for asking about that. So it starts November 1st, and it's the 30-day Love Your Body Breakthrough course. And I just was talking to a student last night about it, and she was telling me that she had an amazing experience when she went through it in June, and that what she learned was that she could really be a better friend to her body, and that she actually was very fond of her body when she was able to let go of a lot of her negativity about it and not get so caught up in judgment and self-criticism, that, um, that she actually had some love for her body that she can now, that's kind of like a seed that she's planted that she's now nurturing and helping to grow in her life. There was something that you had in your book that I really liked about Thanksgiving, and Thanksgiving coming up, and it was the way how you presented the dinner. So can you recap a little bit of that for us? Yeah, my sister and I came up with this idea several years ago to serve dinner instead of as a buffet, in courses. Mm. And what that meant was that at the table, we were all eating like the soup together, we all ate the salad together, we all ate like the main course and side dishes together. And that was wonderful because it gave us this sense of more community and more of a sense of instead of the meal taking 12 hours to prepare and 12 minutes to eat, mm -hmm. <laughs> the meal actually got to be a lot longer and we got to talk and communicate more, which was wonderful and enjoy the food more. Yeah. Well, I think that's one thing. I know in our house, I mean, we put the buffet out and my guests are eating. Because, you know, you tell them to go ahead 
And some of them are almost finished by the time the host gets to sit down. Exactly. <laughs> He's out serving and everybody's piling yeah, and, it on. And and they're ready for <laughs> seconds and stuff. And, you know, you just what you want to tell them, slow down and enjoy your food. <laughs> right. Because you really wonder if they're actually doing that. Yeah. So it's like, um, well, we, we have just a, about a minute here. If you would like to say something that we haven't talked about, is there anything that you would like to talk about? I would love to talk about how important it is to learn to listen to your body from the inside out mm -hmm. um, and to know that, um, to look for practices that really help you do that. So things like yoga practice, things like intuitive eating um, can really help you start to listen inside to feel um, what's going on in your body to start to be really be aware of what your body needs so that instead of letting the world tell us what our body needs and what our body should look like that we start to let our body decide what it needs mm -hmm. and let it decide what it looks like and be loved for what it is ah, well that's so so important uh, you know writing these books um, you were telling me like this first one took like 11 years was it? Yeah. 11 years to write this first 11 book. 11 years. And the second book? The second book I wrote in just 100 days. See? <laughs> See? Well, you know, since I didn't have so much negativity around my body, which yes. was wasting a lot of my time and energy, I had a lot more energy to put into writing the second book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I was able to put it together so you right away. were constantly growing while you were writing this first book, and you were finding out more about, about yourself while you were writing, I would assume. Yeah, that writing right. has a way of doing that, opening it up, giving you sometimes more insight about yourself because now you're expressing it on paper and you say, oh my God, I don't, yeah, I just realized something about myself. And it's, that's one of the great things about writing. Absolutely. It's therapy. Well, listen, thank you so much for being here. I, I just really enjoyed watching you. And I would like to tell everybody out there to take a moment and think about your body. What does it do for you? It really works hard for you. So what have you done for it? Can you do something for it like love it, nurture it, work it, and honor it? Thanks for watching the show and watch again. Would you mind signing the book? Oh, I'd love yeah. to. Thank you for asking. I love the book. It was yeah. really, really good. Very, I could see where that probably was hard to write about something. Also, so long.